kind of like when someone's summoning Everest, they have the Sherpa with them who knows the mountain better than them, and they're kind of walking up with them. So I know, well, dude, it's super, super stretch analogy. I'm rolling my eyes at myself. It was just off the cuff. I, I, it's good. You, you're the you're the Sherpa. Is that what, what they're called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're the Well, you're trying to find a way to give yourself the title of Sherpa. Uh, so Tanner Sherpa Howell, that's yeah, your Tanner name. Sherpa from, Howell, yes. From, from, so tell your, tell your, all your employees. I'm going to update my LinkedIn. I'm going to update yeah. my LinkedIn right now. Uh, actually, I would love to see that. <laughs> if you do, please let me know. Uh, I will. I will. But yeah, so, how does one become a Sherpa? I mean, that is the the million dollar question, right? Like, how do you get to that point? I feel like we just segued into the second topic we wanted to talk about. How do you get to that point where you feel confident enough in your abilities to? guide someone towards that realization, right? Like, how do you go to a CISO and tell them, like, no, you're the way you're doing your cybersecurity training is all wrong. Like, nobody wants to be told their baby's ugly, but how do you get them to go, oh, there's a different way we could do this. There's a better way we could do this. Okay. Uh, That's yeah. Well, before we get to that second, I guess, point, going back to the first point, we're we want right. to talk about open and learning. Got ahead of how, how does one become like have the knowledge to guide people up Everest. Right? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean you, you gotta you... be learning all the time, right? You can never get complacent. Yeah. We like to, there's a joke in this industry that there's like the dog years of cybersecurity. Every year is like seven. And like, you have to be reading the news. You have to, you know, find different, um, for lack of a better phrase, like threat feeds, right? Get open source intelligence out there. Like see what researchers are saying. Um, and it can be really daunting, but I mean, the nice thing about cybersecurity and one of the things I love the most about it is that like everybody here is very passionate. Everybody wants to keep learning. Everybody wants to be build the perfect system uh, to use a Tron reference. Uh, and it, what it does is it creates a really collaborative environment where everybody's sharing what they're what they're learning with the next person who's then getting their knowledge out of it, applying the the not prerequisite, but um, earlier knowledge they already had, passing it to that third person to put their take on it. And then you have this like giant community, communal knowledge of different threat actors, different um, malware variants, et cetera, et cetera. So is it like each SE on their own are going out doing their own research and then combining the information all together? Yeah. I mean, so we kind of, and that's, I mean, every team will be run differently. That's kind of how I run my team is I, I say we're all adults. Like this is the broad vision. Like I'm not going to micromanage you as you execute towards it. I just care that you're up to date on the latest threats. That's the goal. If you want to read, I don't know, Reddit as your sole source, if as long as you're getting the actual, I probably wouldn't recommend that, but as long as you're getting to that goal, like I'm not going to micromanage my people to get there. Um, and then we do internal knowledge sharing sessions on what we find. In my head, it just popped up like, would it be, or how, how would it be different if you had a team that does the research and provided a newsletter to everybody instead of everybody? Because like, as ease from what I've seen, I'm not experienced mm -hmm. at all. Uh, we're always, if we're spending time learning, that means we're time away from our customers. So how, how do we maximize our learning time or how do we make it the most efficient as possible um, so that our salespeople don't get pissed off at us when we tell them like, hold on one second, I need to go learn or tell like our spouses, our significant others, like, okay, hey, I'm gonna have to spend the night researching stuff. So less time for you and the, and the kids or whatever your situation is. Well, and that one, I mean, that last one that you just said, I mean, that is a big one, right? Um, it's, I mean, I have a book right here for a cert that I want to take that I still have yet to crack open because my six month old is teething. And by the end of the day, my wife is like, I just need like an hour. And I'm like, well, I can't, I can't be like, no, I'm going to lock myself in my office and I'm yeah. going to you know, study. Um, but to answer that first question, I mean, I think that that's the, the, the responsibility of, you know, the, that SE leader and that senior sales management to know that your SEs need to stay up to date. If your SEs walk into 
a customer demo, for example, and they're talking about a product that got bought out a year ago. The customer is going to go like, these guys don't know what they're doing, right? So it's my job and my, and I, if my team's listening, I hope that they're <laughs> agreeing with me. It's my job as their leader to make sure that they have clear education goals set for them and that if they want guidance on how to get them, I'll give them guidance or I can, you know, just let them be free range, if you will. Um, but they're also given time to do that. So, you know, hey, Friday afternoons, uh, block your calendar from two to four, unless, you know, obviously a big customer comes in, that will be protected focus time. Yeah, so I, I agree with pretty much everything you said. The, if I wanted to push back to play devil's advocate, because that's what I do. Uh, if everyone's booking their Friday afternoon off and knowing salespeople, every customer is a big customer. Whether that's true or not, that's a different story. Yeah. So how does one actually protect their calendar without getting the boss involved every single time? Because you have, like the boss, the sales, person, the sales engineer manager has other crap to do in terms of hiring, firing, goal setting and all that crap. How do people actually manage that? I think that that really boils down to that SEAE relationship, right? Like, not to say like it's transactional or it's give or take, but like if your AE is trying to book your Friday, like then block, you know, move that hour to Wednesday or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. But know that if your AE is taking that protected time, it actually is a big one, not just, I don't know, like one guy who's like, oh, I'm very interested. I'm an influencer. And you're like, okay, but like, did this have to happen right now? Did we have to drop everything for this one? Yeah. So. Uh, so, so something about I've experienced is that even if someone puts something on your calendar, it doesn't that automatically mean you have to accept. Right? Also true. You can always say like, what is this about? As you can tell, if, when you looked at my calendar before booking this, you know, passive aggressive, uh, I have another meeting booked. Can we move this a couple hours earlier or later? Exactly. Right? And mo more often than not, the salesperson is like, oh, sorry, I forgot to look at your calendar. Let me just bump it up a couple of hours or move it around. So it's less of a problem than we make it out. Yeah. To well, that was a way more elegant way than what I was trying to say. Because I was well, well, I'm about you, it. You, you, yeah, you said it. I mean, it's the what's that phrase? It was the quiet part out loud of like just asking yeah. to move the meeting. Like, yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing: I was talking to another gentleman who got a meeting set up for yeah. an hour and a half. He like he was on the YouTube channel uh, a while back talking about this problem, and. The, the the salesperson set up an hour and a half and he was getting annoyed like what why an hour and a half well, what am i going to do filling up the hour and a half and he comes and talks to me like do you need to talk for an hour and a half did you ask here the salesperson was like let me ask him do we need the hour and a half no i just booked it in case we need it end of end of uh, yeah. problem. and then like that was it right yeah. i also it also in my opinion like it makes us look really good to the customer like there's the um the phrase like if you can be anything in this world be the person who ends a meeting early like yeah. if you give that person back 20 minutes of their time or 30 minutes of their time. Like they're going to be like, Oh, like obviously that I am not suggesting book 90 minute demos and then always end them early. But like, if you get given that big block of time, you're not stuck in that call. Right. It can wrap. I don't mind giving uh, like putting 90 minutes every time for a demo mainly because it gives us time for conversations. If Absolutely. I do a good job in a demo, there's going to be conversations. But right. and then I have the option to end it early. I, I, and something I noticed, if I tell the customers, like, hey, I booked an hour, but I want to take a, I booked an hour and a half, but I only want to take an hour of your time. And then we get into conversations and we go over a little bit longer. Then I lied, right? I lied to them. I promised them an hour. Right. But if I don't say anything, so it worked. Like, they're happy if I finish early. So, yeah. it's uh... Okay, so setting up an hour a week. Sounds reasonable. Do you, is your preference to set up like a block of time for two hours on a Friday afternoon or like half hour every day? Which, which is your preference? My, well, and this is where, you know, it all depends on the individual, right? And the way the teams run. I prefer the bigger block of time because what I find if I'm doing like half hours, I'm context switching. Like by the time I like sit down, I get my coffee and I crack open this book that I promised I'm going to read for the cert. Um, but I'll, a half hour, I'm only really going to get like 15, 20 minutes of like focus time, where if I block two hours, 
I'm probably going to get an hour and a half to an hour 45 of, you know, head downtime. That's Assuming what, that my kids aren't home and don't just walk in my office. That, that's very interesting because I feel like I'm the opposite. I yeah. can I can focus for an, for a half hour straight. I mean, I'll go get my coffee a little bit beforehand and right. I sit down and work on it. But for an hour and a half, I always get people pinging me. And yeah. because it's half hour, I can say, you know what, I'm just not going to respond until the end of the half hour. But that's just... So there's two different methods to, I guess, everything. Personal style, personal style. 